once again, congratulations on this important event. I did speak yesterday for a brief period, but I'll try not to repeat uh, what I was uh, saying there. Now, as everybody knows, there's going to be a vote on fees in Parliament tomorrow. But as so often, there's a sense in which fees are not the root issue. Of course, they're important, but the root issue is the fact that the government is cutting the university teaching budget by 80% and removing all funding for the teaching of humanities and social sciences in the universities. And it's doing that to save money. And the money's got to be made up from somebody, and of course it's going to be made up either from the universities themselves in reducing and eliminating courses, or from students. They don't be deceived by all that spin about students being better off in the long run. The fundamental fact that, of course, this is the government trying to save money. Now, as I said yesterday, the sum is minuscule in the broader scheme of things. It's saving three billion pounds a year in relation to the billion spent on bailing out the bankers, in relation to the billion spent on renewing Trident, in relation to the billions of tax uncollected from billionaires, and so on and so forth. Three billion a year is a tiny sum of money. So it's not just about saving money. In particular, it's an onslaught on the principle that the arts, the humanities, and the social sciences should receive any public money at all. It puts them in a very special place. They're not like health, they're not like schools, they're not like museums, not like sport, not like stupid wars. They're um, things that absolutely no money should go into subsidizing. They are a commodity and not a right. So they have the right to be educated free up to a certain age, but after that it becomes a commodity or a personal investment. So even this minuscule sum, this comparatively minuscule sum, that makes a huge difference to you and to us and to the universities is being withdrawn. That's the real issue. That should not get submerged in the issue of the size of the fees and the problems of the Lib Dems. The media have an unerring instinct to ignore what is fundamental, to ignore what is really important, which in this case is this massive cut, based, well, massive for us, based on the principle that the arts and the humanities deserve no public support at all. Now, I think, and we should say, that this is something that does de deserve a collective expenditure, and we should be able to say why that is so. People often say, well, it's good for the economy that people are able to, speak, to, to think, to speak, and to write, all those things that people acquire in, in, in all degrees, but also in particular those in the humanities and the social sciences. And that is true. Clearly, it is good for the economy, and people trot out statistics about how the UK spends less public money on higher education than other countries in Europe, and that, of course, is very much to the point. But we should also say, and we should not be embarrassed about saying, that studying the humanities and the social sciences, and indeed all subjects, is a good in itself. It's one of those things that makes life worth living. It is conducive to individual and social well-being in a way that a mere accumulation of wealth the size of the gross national product is not conducive. Now, even David Cameron, even David Cameron has said, well, the gross national product isn't everything. There is this thing called happiness. And happiness studies are flourishing. And one of the things that happiness studies tells you is that despite the enormous economic growth over the last 30 years, people are not any happier. Now, that's a significant statistic. All this economic growth we're so proud of, and they're not any happy, so what's the point? And happiness studies tell you that in order for people to be happy, and of course there's all sorts of statistical problems in coming to the figures, but roughly speaking, there's a consensus on the fact that in order for people to be happier, you have to have a certain economic level. So if your society is very, very poor, <coughs> I'm help people will be less happy. When you've reached a certain economic level, which this country reached roughly in the 60s, piling on wealth after that doesn't increase happiness. So what's the point? And an absolutely devastating conclusion for these happiness studies is that the more unequal a society is, on the whole, the less happy people are. So maybe David Cameron is paying lip service to the stunning insight that happiness is the most important thing rather than the gross national product. The politicians have finally got there, realize this obvious point, 
But of course, his policies are going in precisely the opposite direction as society gets more and more unequal, and the same was true under the last Labour government, alas. Now, in order to, to make the point about the value of this relatively cheap investment in the humanities and social sciences in our universities, I want to give you a kind of mirror image, the opposite image. I want to introduce you to the world of Philip Green, Sir Philip Green, consultant to the government on efficiency and enormously wealthy businessman. And the Philip Green is the sort of man that uh, uh, pays five million pounds for a party and all the rest of it, and I won't get into that. He's very good at avoiding tax. Recently, 1.2 billion pounds was paid legally into his wife's bank account in Monaco, on which no tax was paid at all. And once again, let me emphasize that the sums of money, the billions of money, pounds these people are dealing with, make the investment in the universities look tiny. And if the government was serious about paying off the deficit and, 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 and limiting cuts in public expenditure, they wouldn't be cutting the number of officials in the revenue. They would be increasing the number of officials so that we can actually collect these huge sums of unpaid tax particularly from wealthy people. That is known as the tax gap. Now, what is the ideal society for Philip Green and people like him? Firstly, there are a lot of boring jobs on low wages because low wages bring high profit. And you certainly don't need to go to university to produce mega profits for Philip Green. What do people do? Well, they work all day. In the evening, they watch the telly or go clubbing. And at the weekend, they go shopping, preferably in Topshop. <laughs> and so ideally, for people like Philip Green, society should consist entirely in PACs, the PACs. PACs, passive, atomized consumers. That is the ideal society for people like Philip Green and his political supporters. Everybody's a passive, atomized consumer, and that produces maximum profit and uh, well, that's just the ideal society. There are very many such people, they are very powerful, and they have no interest in the humanities and the, and the social sciences. Um, they would regard it as positively dangerous, and precisely because of the enormous virtues of the subjects that we study, both for our individual happiness and for the well-being of society. It's not just that, clearly, in our kind of society, in order to achieve any level of permanent uh, well-being and happiness, it's important to have some kind of intellectual curiosity, some kind of appreciation of literature, of the past, of art, of, of science, of just to take pleasure in understanding and the attempt to understand, it seems to me it's absolutely vital for any kind of sanity in our world. I mean, they're opening up a mood disorder center at this university, that's good. But of course, it may well be based on the idea that the origin of depression is physiological. Well, I have to tell you something, it's not. Depression has a phys physiological correlate. And indeed, there may be some cases where physiological degeneration produces depression. But it's obvious that depression is a lack of social energy. Depression is, you, is what you get when you're a PAC. It goes together, it fits like the, a glove on a hand. Depression and PAC goes together. And and the, I do hope the mood disorders um, center will be just slightly politicized in, in this way. Uh, now, um, above all, the threatening nature of the humanities and social sciences is that they give people the opportunity to understand society as a whole, to see things as a help. And I'm always reminded of the remark made by Albert Speer, who was Hitler's architect. He wasn't a completely wicked man, I and mean, he got 20 years jail for being Hitler's architect. He wasn't completely wicked, and he was quite cultivated. And afterwards, people said to him, how did you do it? You know, how could you, a cultivated architect, uh, designing these great buildings, be part of this regime? And he said, well, the trick of it was, the trick of it was that everybody just did the bit that they were assigned. Everybody just got on with the job that they'd been given. Nobody was trying to stand back and see things as and that's how the Nazi regime worked. But, of course, we're not in danger of having a Nazi regime, but we are in danger of, of the most extraordinary uh, catastrophes, whether it's man-made global warming, social disintegration, and so on. And 
We need badly more than we need ever more commodities. People who can think as a whole, people who have